Hi everyone, today we're joined by Lars and he tells us how to construct equivalent energy-based models and you can find all the information to join the future reading group sessions yourself in the description. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Lars Holdijk. Um, I'm currently a DPhil or PhD student, whatever you want to call it, at the University of Oxford. Um, I started here last week after doing my master's at the University of Amsterdam. Um, the master's in AI. And as part of my master's in, um, in Amsterdam, I worked with Professor Max Welling, uh, where we're mostly looking at generative modeling for um, applications in computational chemistry. Uh, and this work is one, basically one half of my master's thesis. Um, yeah, so uh, before, <laughs> before getting into it, um, I had a really early flight this morning. I do like fly at 6 a.m. to get up at 2 a.m. So if I do uh, come across a little bit loopy and sleepy, uh, please let me know and I'll try to energize myself a little bit more. Um, and also I do tend to speak quite quickly whenever I'm discussing presentations or whatever. So please let me know if I'm, I'm going too fast or uh, skimming over details that I should be discussing. Um, so with that said, um, as Hans already mentioned, this work was also presented last year at, uh, at, um, at NeurIPS. Um, so if you're familiar with it from there or otherwise would like um love to hear it. Um me and Hans had a really nice chat there last year, so that's great. Um yeah. So to get into the, the motivation of this work, um I think it's very similar to most of the works presented at, at this reading group. Um is that real world observations really comprised of symmetries and therefore the probabilistic models that they admit could also be invariant to the symmetry transformations. Um, what I mean with this is that, for example, if you take the example of a, of a molecule, it's that molecules really don't care about their orientation in space or their, their location in space. Um, you can turn them around whatever you want and um, the uh, probability of observing them really doesn't change. Um, and we kind of need to take this into account whenever we are trying to model these, these distributions. So um, also, for example, in this, uh, these four Gaussians that I have on the slides here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but um, let, please let me know if you, you can't. So I have four Gaussians here that have an, have an equal weight. Um, and if we want to sim um, uh, sample from this, this distribution, it doesn't really make sense to sample across all the four Gaussians at the same time, because we know that there's a symmetry group. Um, we can do a sample from one of the modes and then we can by rotation get all the other samples as well. Um, and this intuition is what we wanted to build into our um, sampling procedures. Uh, so we started out with the hypothesis that by incorporating these known symmetries as an inductive bias, um, we will, it will lead to a more efficient model estimation and sampling. Um, so what you can kind of see from this hypothesis is that we have a, a twofold hypothesis here where we're both interested in, in making the model estimation simple, um, more efficient as well as the sampling procedure. Um, yeah, so if we look at our contributions, that is also kind of reflected there. Um, so again, we want to incorporate symmetries as indicative biases in our generative models. And we do that uh, in one contribution in the sampling process. Um, so give like in the sampling, I mean, like given a model P, uh, we want to get samples from this model, uh, model, um, or distribution, whatever you want to call it. Um, and for this purpose, we um, made an equivariant version of the standard variational gradient descent sampler. And then on the other side, we have model estimation, uh, where we're already given a bunch of data uh, and then want to learn which model this data is sampled from. And for this purpose, we um, built a equivariant version of just general energy-based models. Um, and then interesting, there's like an interplay between our equivariant EBM with our equivariant version of HVDD that kind of makes both of them work very, very nicely together. Um, and then again, to note is that we are here specifically interested in uh, models P that are inferior to some symmetry group. Um, yeah. So with that said, uh, let's look at the first contrib uh, contribution, equivariant Stein variational gradient descent. Um, so... St uh, like I think Stein variational gradient descent is kind of a niche in the whole sampling uh, world, um, so I'm not too sh like too familiar uh, or not sure how familiar everyone it 
is with it yeah. but it's i think we definitely uh, want the introduction on, on okay SCD. perfect so um let me give you a very uh quick and intuitive um introduction so if you um it works very similar to normalizing flows where we start off with uh, sampling from some proposal distribution. Um, so in, in this case, we call it Q0. Um, and you, you sample a bunch of samples from this, this proposal distribution. And just like in normalizing flows, you kind of want to learn a sequence of transformations that then kind of like transform these samples from your proposal distribution as to um, kind of like transform them such that they now lie within your uh, target distribution. Um, but interestingly, in Stein variational gradient descent, this transformation is not uh, defined as just for every um, sample uh, independently, but it transforms all samples right, basically together uh, to push them from their initial distribution um, to, the, to the target distribution. And it also following this kind of like this update rule on, on the top right here. Um, we're at every time step, all uh, step. Yes, Hannes? So if I want a single sample, I have to, uh, yeah. Or yeah, if I want a single sample, I need to sample many things and then choose one of those samples. Yeah, so you kind of just sample a bunch of points and then perform this, um, well, the sequence of update steps uh, that you have above. Uh, and in this way, transform them all to the to the target distribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in this update step, um, we're going to see that for, for every time step, uh, D, um, for every sample I, we update it based uh, on all samples around it. Um, so we sum over, uh, over J, uh, so all other samples N. Um, and in each update step, we kind of like have a, this kernel function K, which is update, uh, which is uh, modeling the interactions between the samples. So like how far are they away from each other? Uh, and then there's the energy, uh, energy function uh, because we're interested in energy functions, E for which we take the gradient to kind of like guide it towards the target distribution, right? So we have a, um, how do you say it? We have um, a, kind of like a, a pulling force, this kernel in combination with uh, this gradient of the energy function that kind of like pulls all samples towards the minimal energy conf uh, configuration within the our target distribution. He kind of like parameterizes the target distribution. And then we have a repulsive force which is this kernel K here that kind of like makes sure that all the samples within the target distributions are nicely distributed across the whole distribution and not just sitting in the in the mode. Okay. Um, right. uh, I could also do like Markov chain Monte Carlo or take your energy that you have here and do Markov chain Monte Carlo or like Langevin dynamics with it, right? Um, yeah, so we do we don't do know the gradient of the energy function. So there's there's different methods that you could uh, could use for sampling um, from the distribution. Uh, we're just specifically interested in this form uh, of sampling because we're interested in using this kernel function K as a way to guide uh, the sampling process to make it equivariant. Okay, so you specifically look at this way to sample from some energy function because um, you're, this is especially in, amenable to making it equivariant. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, with that very broad, like low level introduction to Stein variational gradient descent, um, it's kind of, yeah, maybe let's now look at how, um, this equivariance comes into play then. Um, and for this purpose, we, um, were quite inspired by a work by, uh, I think it's Jonas Köhler, um, from Frank News Group in, um, in Berlin, um, where they had a paper on equivariant normalizing flows. Um, and then they have a very nice discussion of how you can make a, uh, can transform, um, 
uh, effective fields uh, in an invariant manner. Um, and if we just very broadly restate that theorem for, in their case, to uh, a theorem that is useful for our case in standard variational gradient descent, what it basically is said is that if we have a distribution Q0 from which we sample our initial points, then um, where, where Q0 is G invariant, so in, invariant to the group uh, that we're interested in, then the target distribution P after doing this transformation of all the samples is also G invariant. If the kernel that we used use is also G invariant. So the only thing that we need to do to make this whole Stein variational gradient descent sampler equivariant or invariant is make sure this kernel K here is itself also uh, invariant to the same symmetry group that we're interested in. So it's quite a straightforward way of updating the um, Stein variational gradient descent sampler. Um, so it's, we really only need to look at this kernel K. Um, and for this purpose, we kind of looked at a few different, uh, quite straightforward, different ways of constructing a, a G invariant kernel function. Um, so the first option is whenever we have a discrete uh, symmetry group, where it kind of like um, can just sum over all um, uh, samples within the orbit of a sample. Uh, and if we then just sum this, then we can basically get a invariant kernel by itself. Um, and then the second option um, is for continuous sym symmetry groups, where one method of doing it is quite straightforward by um, doing some approximation of the, um, um, yeah, doing some uh, basically an approximation of an invariant kernel, where now kind of like Monte Carlo sample all possible um, transformations from a specific group and, and add them together. Um, so that roughly the the kernel is invariant, or we can use an um, kind of have an exact method, and we can do this when we know uh, an invariant um, function for the the object that we're interested in, uh, that preserves all the information, of course. But these are two methods uh, for having a continuous symmetry group, um, or a kernel for a continuous symmetry group. Um, and then interestingly, but, but not really used in the paper. You can also uh, construct equivariant matrix value kernels. There's a really interesting paper by Reiset and Burkhardt uh, from 2007, where they show how you can construct a equivariant kernel function by taking the um, um, representation of a, or just having a regular kernel and multiplying it by the representation of a uh, of the group um, to get a yeah an equivariant matrix value kernel. So these are kind of like three options that we have for constructing this kernel, uh, and then once we choose one of them, depending on which symmetry group we're actually interested in, uh, we get a equivariant Stein variational gradient descent sampler that is invariant to this uh, symmetry group. Uh, so that was our, the first uh, contribution. And then the second contribution, oh, let's, before diving into the second one, let's first actually look at some, uh, some key results for this sampler. Um, so here we again have this four Gaussian example of um, basically having one Gaussian rotated four times. Um, and now we kind of want to sample efficiently from this whole space. And for that purpose, we know that we can basically sample from one of the modes and then replicate all samples around to get uh, basically all samples that we're interested in. Um, and if we do that with just a regular Stein variation, okay, the send sampler, that we see that these, the the samples, like, let me show you. So we start off with just sampling a bunch of points from a uh, normal distribution um, across the whole space, so across all the Gaussians. And then, uh, well, HVDD just updates them until they all sampled from our target distribution. Um, but depending on where these initial dis samples are sampled from, roughly in the space, um, they fall into different modes of our target distribution. Um, which is which is fine, but the results of this is that um, there's no interaction between the kernel points um, in the different modes. Right? The kernel is only looking at the local area uh, around each point. So samples that are in different modes don't really interact with each other. Um, which if we now come um, collapse them into the into one single mode, 
we see that there's quite a lot of overlapping samples and doesn't really evenly distribute itself themselves around these modes, um, which is not what we want. Instead, if we look at ESVGD, ESVGD, it's it's really a terrible name for uh, giving presentations. Um, but if we now look at our samples that we sample from our, like starting off with our uh, initial proposal samples, uh, then we transform them. And then we kind of see that our uh, now like samples from our target distribution don't really cover the space that nicely. There's quite a lot of large gaps between them and it doesn't, it doesn't look as neat as the uh, original sampler. But if we now collapse that back into the, this modulo space, where we're only looking at one of the modes, we see that actually all of the articles are very nicely oriented within this single mode and very well uh, capture the whole distribution there, which is great because now we can just rotate them around and basically get all samples, right? Um, yeah, so in this case, it, it, it kind of looks terrible if you look at just the samples in themselves, but when you consider that we are only really interested in sampling one of each mode, um, then it's perfectly what we want. Uh, and this example is even further, I think, Right. Can clear. I interrupt yeah. a little bit? Uh, so what you're doing here, right, is that you start with your initial distribution, which I assume is a Gaussian at, at, at the middle of mm -hmm. your uh, of this thingy, has some standard deviation, and you sample a bunch of points from that. Then you use the energy function that you already have given. Like we're not learning anything here. Uh, we're not in the EBM territory yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and then yeah, you take this ground truth energy function which we know has the c4 symmetry and you run stein variational gradient descent uh, on these initial samples from the normal and then we get for example what we have in the top top left right yeah and why what's now different in the top middle from top left okay yeah um so in the top left, we kind of just see the samples that we just, the actual samples that we sampled using Stein variation gradient descent, um, which is, um, yeah, so that's what we see on the top left. Um, but in our case, what we kind of realize is that it doesn't, um, how can I best phrase this? So if we take the example of a molecule again, then um, we don't care about the orientation of the molecule in space, right? Um, so whenever we we sample it, we we don't just want to get whenever we like take I don't know generate a hundred sample a uh, hundred molecules, we don't just want to have a hundred molecule molecules that are exactly the same but uh, just oriented in different ways. That's kind of just a waste of this whole sampling procedure. We want to just evenly distribute, uh, evenly sample from the whole space that we have. Um, and then um, what you can kind of like envision that is that um, you can rotate all these, these molecules back to one specific conformation of them, like one specific configuration, of, like one specific orientation of these molecules. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're doing in the second plot here. Right, so we have these four Gaussians, but across these Gaussians, the points are basically the same. That we can consider them as being the same um, within the orbit. So now we just collapse them all back into one single um, mode, just to kind of like visualize how well they spread um, the single mode. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, and now we see that it doesn't spread the single mode so well. And that's an artifact of Stein variational gradient descent, right? Because um, we, if we were to sample super many points, uh, very, very many points, then maybe it would uh, look spread out nicely as well as we have it in the bottom row, right? Uh, but now, because we're, um, we only have a few samples here on the top right, uh, top left, mm -hmm or we don't have super, super many samples in the top left, then because we're running this Stein variational gradient descent thing, 
uh, where we're doing the pushing apart and pulling together there are just aren't enough particles to push apart uh, to cover the, yeah. all of the modes right and now we we can be more efficient in running svgd by having uh, fewer samples that don't need to be pushed apart so, so much and putting them all um yeah and yeah just treating them. Uh -huh. yeah yeah what you're saying is right so this is um partly an artifact of not having sufficient samples but as we will see in the s2 invariant uh, version is that in the, um, when we're talking about continuous groups, there's really not a sufficient number of samples that we can use because there's just um, infinite many uh, uh, orientations uh -huh. within the within the orbit. Um, and so just how, to... how, is that really true here over there in the S two example, for example? Um, uh, if we had very like if. The initial sample that we that we did uh, were so many points that um, there would also be points right next to each other. Um, and then would we then get a nice spread across the uh, across the distribution, or would it only still only be at the mode? Um, so if we just increase the number of samples very far. I do think that at some point you will saturate the, in this case, the concentric circles. Um, but it's in that case, you're not spreading out the samples over um, like directions within the data that you're interested in, right? You're yeah. not really interested in how they're sitting next to each other. You're really interested in how they spread across the, the circle. So um, we make our SVGD much more efficient with your equivariance and yeah. we need of much fewer samples. Mm -hmm. And I also quickly want to comment on what you said about this being uh, something that's an issue with um, SVGD because it uses these kernels. It's not just an issue with SVGD. Like if you consider um, uh, this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, there's nothing stopping Hamiltonian Monte Carlo from just um, jumping between different orientations of the same molecule if you were sampling molecules right it there's um yeah so there's the, if you would yeah th there's really just nothing stopping um a a sampler from doing this it, there there is a probability for every orientation for from the molecule so you can just as well just jump between those, those samples um and that's just kind of what we want to overcome by introducing this equivariance that we don't want to sample the same orientation anymore. Um, but yeah, with that said, that's, um, we already alluded it to it about this S2 invariant version, where we now have co two concentric circles. And in this, the standard time variation of gradient descent, we see that we um, all, new, all samples that we get from the distribution kind of coll collapse into like the center of these circles, um, which is not ideal. Um, and now if we look at our equivariance time variation of gradient descent, um, we kind of see that these samples very nicely spread themselves across the circle. We kind of capture the whole distribution within the circle. Um, so yeah, what, does the, what the results of this is, like if we consider the, this S2 invariant version, uh, S2 invariant concentric circles, is that um, if we look at the um, log likelihood of these samples uh, and then take the the true log likelihood here is the dotted black line. We see that our invariant uh, Stein variation of gradient descent version uh, gets very close to this line and it gets basically there with very, uh, very little steps. Uh, now, if we uh, consider the regular version of HVDD, we see that it needs a lot more steps to even uh, somewhat um, converge. Um, and it doesn't really matter how far we increase the, the number of samples that we use. Um, it never really gets as close to this true log likelihood as we would like with our, um, as we found with our invariant version. So it's kind of like one benefit of it that we really need a lot less samples uh, to capture the whole distribution nicely. And the second um, difference is that due to needing less samples, um, 
it's a lot more robust against uh, particle initializations. So if we sample a, a different set of particles from our proposal distribution, the final distribution or the spread of those samples over the, the target distribution is also different. Um, and because we need less samples, um, the spread is slightly less, um, as, a, as a less very, not as big of a variance for our invariant version as our regular version. Um, so yeah, to, to kind of like conclude this first section on equivariant Stein variation of gradient descent, is that our uh, we found that our equivariant HVD is more sample efficient and robust to the initial distribution of particles uh, than its non-equivariant counterpart. Um, yeah. So from there, I kind of want to move into the the other contribution, equivariant EBMs. Uh, where we're now incorporating equivariance uh, in our uh, energy-based model. Uh, so in this case, we like, like we, we train an energy function um, E, which is parameterized by theta, and that uh, energy function then parameterizes the probability distribution pi. Um, and this is done by maximizing the log likelihood of the data using contrasted divergence learning. Um, and what is straightforward, this can be made equivariant by just using some form of equivariant model for this uh, energy function. Um, but what's then more interesting is that in contrasted divergence learning, you have this term where you um, take the expectation over your true samples that are provided within the data set and your expectation over these um, of basically contrastive samples, negative samples that you get from some kind of sampler from your uh, current um, model state. And this sampling procedure can then very nicely be done by our equivariant Stein variation on gradient descent, because we've made this energy function um, equivariant. We know that, this, that the samples that we want to get from it are also invariant to this distribution. And this we can use our equivariant version of Stein variation on gradient descent. Um, and then kind of a, a neat trick is that we can, um, whenever we do this sampling using Stein variation on gradient descent, but we have this rep these repulsion forces of our, our kernel. And we can kind of have this little trick where we use the positive samples that were given within our data set as repulsion forces within our um, actually update steps as well, uh, which is just, yeah, it's, it's just a nice trick that, that, that helped out a lot with, with training these models. Um, Wait, so this is it's just a trick to in, in, increase the number of samples that we can use uh, during our Stein variational gradient descent. Um, yeah, so these contrastive samples that you sample from your uh, at every iteration of your model, you kind of don't want these to overlap too much with your um, with your original data point samples, um, and in. In the nice thing in from Stein variational gradient descent is that you can kind of like hard code that into your sampling procedure by using them as some kind of a repulsion force within your um actually the update step so that you make sure that they never really overlap together. Okay. Um, then is the is what you're are the samples that you're getting out in the end, are those then actually um yeah, are those then actually from the distribution? Um, well, they're, they're not from the distribution, but you also don't want to have them from the distribution because, because you kind of want to enforce that there's, um, I, uh, at least there's, there's low probability in these areas that are not within your uh, data set. And that's kind of what these contrastive samples do is they drop down the probability in these areas. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, so then some some key results for our equivariant EBMs, um, equivariant EBM using uh, some kind of like a toy data set. Um, so what we're doing here is we're, um, oh yeah, that's one more important note to make here. Um, since we're doing just uh, quite standard um, EBMs, there's this paper by, um, I forgot their name, I should have put it on the slides. Um, but where it kind of shows that if you're doing a uh, standard EBM training, you can just as well do a kind of like a joint energy-based model uh, where you can also condition on certain aspects of your data space. Um, so if we consider that for our use case here, 
Um, so this is a toy data set where again, we have four Gaussians in the center, but now we also have four Gaussians around it. Um, where we kind of can say these four outer uh, Gaussians are class and the inner Gaussians are one other class. So then we kind of draw a decision boundary around them based on uh, which one is the highest probability. Um, and then using the EBM, uh, or this of course is like a joint uh, dis uh, probability distribution as well as um, distributions conditioned on which class of samples we have. Right, so we have our decision boundary, our joint distribution, the class one conditional and the class two conditional. Um, and then we can just sample from this distribution where we have these conditional distributions as well. And kind of like plot the same values as well for our Stein variational gradient descent as well as our equivariant Stein variational gradient descent. Um, and then we find that for the non equivariant version, we do find roughly the same decision boundaries and there's like a clear definition between the outer ring of Gaussians and the inner ring of Gaussians. But besides that, there's really not, um, like it, it, it just has these two concepts of outer, uh, the outer ring and the inner ring. Um, and then if you would sample from like, you can get samples quite far away from where the, um, the original or the true samples are. So between between these two Gaussians, there's really not a lot of probability mass, and we still get uh, samples from there. Um, now, if we use our equivariant version, so we have an equivariant EBM that uses an uh, energy-based model that knows these, basically that we have these four um, four parts in our um, distributions, um, and then we also use uh, so we use an equivariant EBM and our equivariant Stein variational gradient descent sampler to sample from it. And then we see that we um, get these clear distinctions of having four clusters for each uh, each ring. Um, so if we, for example, look at the, the inner ring of four Gaussians, we see that we have uh, some clear clusters forming in there as well. And we have the same for our outer ring here. Right, so this is kind of what we would want to see. Ideally, it would like fully form the Gaussians, but that just yeah, it's not the case for these kind of models. It's um, it's a full space, so yeah, I, I would be surprised if any model would find this. Um, but yeah, um, okay, we have now kind of discussed both the equivariant energy-based model as well as our equivariant uh, Stein variational gradient descent sampler. Um, and now I kind of want to look into, I think it's three different areas uh, where this is uh, of interest, these, these equivariant distributions, invariant distributions. Um, so the first is, is uh, many body particle systems, uh, which is um, um, basically four, partic four particles that are following some energy distribution. Um, and in this case, we, have five uh, meta stable states from this energy distribution. These are these five states. Uh, and using these five states, we want to learn the, the energy function that describes them. Uh, and then uh, using an energy based model, an equivalent energy based model, and then uh, sample from this energy based model to get um, that basically to see if we can find them all again. Uh, so again, we have a a target distribution here that's translation and rotation invariance variant. So um, while we have these five meta stable states here, they could have occurred in any uh, rotation or any trans or any point in uh, in space. Um, and then for our equivariant model, we use a simple M uh, MLP, MLP um, with an invariant kind of like a invariant function to make it um, equivariant. So uh, with that said, like. Again, this is the these are the true samples that we've gotten from our um, energy function, and um, yeah. Um, so then, just to quickly describe the, the training um, setup. So we sample these five, one of each made a stable state, um, and then we create a data set using um, basically adding some some Gaussian noise to these points. So that we have basically, I think, 200 samples of each meta stable state uh, within our data set and then train an EBM on it. 
Um, so if we train in, in just a regular EBM and a, using a regular Stanford variational gradient descent sampler, we find that the model really only learns these exact configurations of the um, made stable states. So it finds the exact same um, states as we have in our true data set, uh, which is interesting, um, but or to be expected. Um, but what we know is that these made stable states can or occur in every orientation. Um, so we kind of want to sample them in all orientations. And um, like as expected, when we use an energy-based model with an our an, our equivariant energy-based model with our equivariant time variational gradient descent, the samples that we get from the trained EBM actually show all these different orientations. All right. So at the bottom uh, row, we see the same um, made of stable states, but we see them in different orientations and in different um, uh, and translated as well. So this is kind of um, nice to see is that now by training a model only on one orientation of every made stable state, we can train an, an, an EBM that still recovers all possible orientations and then also efficiently sample from those using our equivariant standard variation of gradient descent. Why are now the, like, we exactly reproduce the matter stable states with our regular Stein variational gradient descent energy based model, right? Yeah. Um, but with the invariant one, even if we would rotate them, uh, our samples, we wouldn't have exactly the same uh, rotate and translate, right? Yeah. Why? Like Why they're also not exactly the same, right? So there's a, um, um, so for example, if you compare these two, they're also like this center, um, center dot is kind of shifted a little bit. Um, and this has to do with how we uh, construct our data set. So we didn't just want to feed five, just five samples to a data set. So we did add a little bit of noise to each sample to kind of like, um, yeah, don't have to, to get a little bit of a spread in the samples that we have. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess this, this is more, this spread is more clear when you actually look at different instantiations of the of the same made stable states with different orientations and such, uh, where there's like small, small noise that we add to the system is kind of like observed more heavily. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, this is, just to summarize this, this got an interesting results where we, we, where we find that we can train an energy-based model on just a few samples, really only showing one orientation and still recover the entire uh, entire space. Um, but this is quite a, a toy example still. So now we kind of like want to look at this slightly more ML um, or machine learning uh, field. And oh, yeah, sorry. This is a quick remark that I wanted to make. Uh, so for those uh, familiar with the work from from uh, from Kohler, um, they also use this uh, double well example for their uh, paper. They do use a slightly different setup than we use. Um, I, I can, it's discussed in the uh, supplementary of our, uh, of the paper. Uh, happy to discuss it later, but I just wanted to make this quick remark for anyone else confused about it. Um, but yeah, a different um, area where we kind of wanted to try our EBM and SVGD methods um, is to conditionally sample uh, rotations of, or conditionally sample um, different rotations of uh, fashion amnist. Um, so as I said before, um, since we're using an EBM, we can also do conditional sa conditional sampling. Uh, and here we kind of con can condition on the kind of um, the kind of uh, clothing that we want to sample from. Uh, so first of all, we um, kind of built in this um, distribution or the symmetry of having 90 degree rotations within the data. Um, uh, but just to be clear, we only provided samples to our data set with unrotated. So, so where the clothes were basically in the correct orientation. Um, but we know that we are kind of like interested in sampling rotations as well. Um, so in our EBM, we built in this symmetry by using a steerable CNN and then by um, 
and then also within our kernel function for HVD, we built in this 90 degree rotations. Um, so then we can train our uh, EBM using our standard variational gradient descent sampler. Um, and then we kind of get this joint distribution in the bottom left, where we can now again see without having it headed in the training data, we can find all these different uh, rotations of our, our images. Um, and then interestingly, we can also do this conditionally, so we can just specify which kind of clothes we want um, and then get a very nice different orientations of these of these clothes, um, which is great. Um, and then as we saw before, we can use this also for classification. Um, and then we can find kind of see that uh, training is significantly quicker when we use our regular EBM um, than when, whenever we used or it's considerably quicker when, whenever we use the equivariant combination of the EBM and the Stein variational gradient descent than whenever we just use the regular versions of these methods. And that is because we are uh, interested in classifying across all rotations. Uh, and these rotations have simply not been seen by uh, the regular version. Um, and then an, an area in which I'm particularly interested, and I think most of the people here, and that's just uh, sampling molecules, uh, molecular design, or whatever you want to call it, um, where we now know that our uh, target distribution is translation or rotation invariant. Um, so we need to build this into our model as well into our HDD. And for this purpose, we use the uh, EN graph neural network from Satoros and Hokebaum, I think, from 2021. Um, and then train an EBM uh, using uh, like true samples from uh, the QM9 data set, uh, as well as negative samples sampled using our Stein variational gradient descent. And then we can generate molecules um, by sampling from the EBM again. Um, so there's six uh, molecules at the bottom here, uh, kind of giving some qualitative look at the samples. But also if we kind of want to quantify the success of our sampler, we can look at the um, uh, distribution of the bo uh, atomic bond distances and angles. Um, and clearly there's, there's, there's a lot to improve here still, uh, but at least we can find that the um, distribution of the bond angles as well as the distances are roughly in the um, in, in, in the range that we would expect. Um, yeah, so that uh, that said, um, this is this covers all the different uh, experiments that we had in the paper, um, of which, yeah, I, I personally find this one of the most interesting. Um, and since there's a little bit of time left, I thought I would be so bold to do a little bit of advertisement and also quickly sneak in uh, a, a recent paper of mine, um, because I think it's highly related to these kind of problems that we're looking at here. Um, and I think most of the people coming to these um, these reading groups are really interested in everything related to molecules. But Hannes himself is like doing everything with docking at the moment. Um, and um, I think it's a particularly interesting subfield. Um, and our, our like work like these kind of really look at final states. So we are given just a bunch of atoms, and then we want to look at what are the minimal states for these or minimal config energy configurations for these atoms, um, which is kind of a shame because we just look at these final states and kind of like lose all track of what is actually happening behind the scenes, what are actually the, the transitions that occur to go from like a random configurations of atoms to a fully formed molecule, um, or in the case of uh, protein folding, what are actually the transitions that occur starting from an unfolded protein to going to a, pro um, uh, a folded protein. And this is something that we, we look at in our new work, in a, in a new work I did with, again, with Max and, and uh, Priyank, but now also with Junkie do a very hove and band in Ensing, uh, where we specifically are interested in uh, the following problem. Um, let's skip over this slide. Um, yeah, so if you know the two sides of a, of a, of a process, so for example, an unfolded and a folded protein, um, can we not only uh, just do that one shot prediction of giving the folded protein, but also determine the transition path between this unfolded and folded state um, that is the minimal energy. Um, so the minimal work required to actually do this transition. 
Uh, so that's what we look at in our work. So for example, this molecule here um, has two conformations. So it's this conformation and this conformation. And we kind of want to figure out how do we transition between these two states? So we design a stochastic optimal control based approach for this. Um, and this kind of really nicely recovers this transition between different paths of starting in one state and then slowly transitioning across the free energy lens, uh, free energy surface, finding the, the other state uh, at the end. So this animation is a little bit slow and now we're getting there. Uh, but yeah, at some point it kind of nicely guides itself towards the, the other confirmation. Uh, which we do like for small molecules, but also for larger molecules where we where we know that we can want to go from a, a left-handed helix to a right-handed helix, um, where we have different uh, yeah different local locations in which this this shift needs to occur. Um, so this work kind of like looks at different like it looks at a problem that machine learning has been looking a lot at recently is like finding different states of molecules, and now actually. Once we have these states, how can we use these states to find more interesting transition paths between them? And that's, of course, especially interesting when we're looking at protein folding, where we kind of want to know how we can this, uh, fold it. Is this something that actually happens going from a left-handed to a right-handed helix anywhere? Like, is yeah. this transition? Okay. Yeah, there's a... a, 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 a this, Poly proline helix. It is like a, a known um, uh, molecule that is studied in computational chemistry to kind of understand how these um, free energy lands uh, landscapes of, of molecules like operate. Um, and and of course, like for folding proteins, we we obviously know that this is of interest. So yeah, this was a very quick excursion. I just quickly wanted to to squeeze in there. Um, but now to go back to the original work. Um, so yeah, to kind of summarize, um, in the work, we look at uh, two different problems. We look at the problem of sampling, for which we um, kind of like propose this equivariance time for variation of gradient descent sampler. And then um, we look at a, a, a different problem of model estimation for which we propose the equivariant energy-based model, which can then be trained using this equivariance time for variation of gradient descent sampler. Um, and I kind of like, what we we saw in our results is that uh, both an equivariant in, in an equivariant EBM trained with our equivariant time variation on gradient descent is especially well suited for applications in the natural sciences, such as just looking at molecules, uh, but also the study of many body uh, systems. And um, yeah, with that, I kind of want to 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 close it. Um, I had expected the title slide to be there at the end, uh, but it closed there. The PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, if there's any more questions, happy to take them. Um, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Then thank you. And uh, I would maybe wait for a few questions from other ones before I go ahead. Yeah. So anyone in the audience wants to to ask something, then let's maybe can we go to your slide where you show this. Um, were your training objective for your energy based model? Yes. Um, second, I need to start my slides again. Uh, no, no hurries. Yes. So, right here. Is there any way that we can? Sort of see this as matching the scores of your two uh, energy based, um, yeah, of your energy based models, like the score of the true samples and the score of the samples generated with your current energy function. Um, I, I think you probably can make some analogy there somewhat. Um, I'm not sure if there's a uh, I mean, that's, um, if this, if there was like an obvious connection there, that um, uh, should yeah. be apparent to me as well. And then yeah, be, I you've already thought about that. Yeah, I, I've not not thought about it. Um, 
We can look okay. Yeah, I, I think it's just contrastive divergence learning has been around for quite a long time, um, as well as score matching. Um, so if there's any relation between them, which it would be interesting, uh, obviously, um, I'm pretty sure that it should could be findable. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but um, what is what was the name of your new paper? Um, Path integral stochastic optimal control for sampling position paths. And we can find it where? Uh, it's on archive at the moment. Um, and okay. I have this nice QR code here if you want to scan it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, this, this is like really um, looking at a different problem, of course, but it's uh, it kind of orig originates from this um, like all the works work on generating molecular structures and kind of wanting to do a little bit more with it than just generating these molecules and kind of like using these generated molecules to then um, gain a slightly deeper okay. understanding of the actual processes at play there. This is extremely cool. I I will definitely look at that. And uh, like, is this a problem that people are very interested in and finding how we actually transform from one state to the other or do they just want to know the like the, the energy barrier um so there's uh, like a within the computational chemistry i feel there's a bunch of people that are really interested in just seeing um if once we know these transitions uh, can we like reconstruct this free energy service and find where these actual energy barriers are um but it's also an important step in uh, for example, catalyst design is like once we know where these free energy barriers are, how high they are, um, and potentially then we can kind of like uncover so like how can we bring them down so that, uh, transitions that we wish to have occur occur more quickly. Okay, so what people want life. to know is the conformation that we have at the highest energy and like when going between the two and then they can look at this highest energy conformation and see aha uh -huh, there are these two things are very close maybe i can remove this little part from a molecule it still works and then the energy transition is um, or the energy required for the uh, transition is much lower something like um that. yeah i'm not sure if just knowing the the highest energy state is is sufficient for this but it's kind of like the idea <clears throat> behind it is that you want to have no more information that, so that you can then either just physically um, manipulate the system um, or um, I guess model further with it. Um, and then there's also fields of interest where you kind of want to know, okay, uh, what are probably, what are possible reflection points um, or deflection points in these transitions so that uh, maybe we have an issue um, whenever we want to design a, um, a new drug and we know that it has to like, go through a specific process. Uh, we don't just want to end up with the correct work because uh, incorrect work because there's some uh, deflection point within the energy service that we we all we we missed. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of different areas within I think both chemistry and biology or medicine where this is definitely a a interesting uh, study domain. 